I'm Chris Hansen, right now on Crime Watch Daily from here in New York City. A beautiful Texas realtor and mother of two vanishes. Like maybe something happened to her while she was showing a house. Just hours before Hurricane Harvey hits. I began to get worried after she didn't start replying back to my text messages. But Crystal McDowell wasn't a victim of the deadly storm. Cops say someone made her disappear and used the hurricane as a cover-up. I told my husband, I said, I feel something's not right. Nerissa Knight investigates a broken marriage, a jealous ex, and a new boyfriend. Are both men persons of interest? Then, a young single mom winds up at the center of a gruesome mystery. Alice was four months pregnant at the time that she was killed. Today, her boyfriend's shocking secret videos that will reveal a truly sinister motive. And the mistress who turned double agent. Right now. Go, let's go. Jason Matera with Crime Watch Daily. I'm Michelle Sagona from Crime Watch Daily. This. Elizabeth Smart from Crime Watch Daily. It's Anna Garcia from Crime Watch Daily. You got anything to say? It's Crime Watch Daily. What do you mean you don't know she's 13? You're running away now? <laughs> Welcome to Crime Watch Daily, everyone. I'm Chris Hansen. We start today with all new details on a breaking case out of Houston. As entire communities still recover from the damage left behind by the hurricane, one family is dealing with a double dose of pain. Our Nerissa Knight is in Texas now with that. Chris, it's a story of tragedy amid tragedy. While the city of Houston dealt with the devastation of Hurricane Harvey, the family of Crystal McDowell would face another life-altering event. A beautiful mom vanishes in Texas. Crystal was missing. Crystal McDowell disappeared hours before a monster named Harvey came to town. She had kind of just uh, dropped off the face of the earth. What happened to the gorgeous realtor in the Houston suburb of Baytown? Like maybe something happened to her while she was showing a house. Did someone kidnap Crystal at an open house? She drives a nice car. Maybe someone tried to carjack her. Was she trying to flee from a natural disaster? Or did Crystal fall prey to a natural born killer? Everybody was a person of interest. Crystal's smile captivated everyone, and no one adores her more than her best friend, Bronze Beckley. You and Crystal McDowell, you were close. You were like sisters. I guess we met when we were about 17. Her spirit was just radiant, and it affected people. It affected strangers. It, it drew you to her. But she gave her heart to the man who would become her husband, Stephen McDowell. Braun says at first it was a match made in heaven, but quickly turned into hell. They got married in April, and by December they were separated. Just within months? Mm -hmm. So the good times, they didn't last? They didn't last, last yeah. But they reconciled really fast. Because the baby was born, you know, about a year later. First a boy, then a girl. And we want to give you a big kiss, too. Ready? One, two, three. Mwah. Mwah. Braun says the initial growing pains of a young marriage melted away. I mean, they had a great life. They took family vacations together, always on Facebook, loving each other, posting that the, how much they loved each other. They were loving, and he was very kind and sweet and loving towards us. And I mean, it just looked like the perfect little family. But a month later, that ring would be off her finger. Crystal and Stephen divorced. Well, what happened? What started to go wrong? I don't know. Whatever reason she decided to divorce Steve, um, I don't know what that reason was, so. She kept her relationship business private? Probably to the public and probably maybe to some of her closest friends because she didn't want us to worry. Crystal's new townhouse was undergoing a remodel, so she remained in the family home with her ex. Braun says Crystal told her it was becoming difficult. She was a little worried. Um, he had gotten a little possessive, maybe, because he probably thought, okay, we are kind of coexisting. Maybe there is hope for reconciliation. And so when the new boyfriend came into the picture, then that hope is gone. 
The new boyfriend, a well-known jeweler in town, Paul Hargrave. Uh, we met in my store. She came in to have a, a ring remade. It was her grandmother's ring. She was a, a beautiful person inside and out. She's unlike anyone I've ever met. Paul says their relationship heated up quicker than summer in Texas. You love Crystal. We were very close, yeah. So close that Crystal and Paul exchanged adorable love notes on text message. I've seriously never been happier. I love you. Had you talked about marriage? Um, we tentatively talked about a few things, but again, this relationship was, was fairly new. We were talking about possibly our moving in. Um, she didn't want to be by herself. Paul says Crystal didn't want to give her ex too much information because Stephen may not be too happy that they were dating. She didn't want him to know uh, much at all, I guess due to the fact of, of his reaction and um, what he would say or do. He would probably learn about Paul soon enough. Stephen and Crystal were set to go on a cruise with the kids and her uncle. But Paul says at the last minute, Crystal disinvited Stephen and asked him to go on the cruise. But she wanted you to go and brought you a ticket, and then she was going to tell him he wasn't going at all. That's correct. I don't think they were getting along well at that time, and I think she was um, ready to, to get out of the house. Then an unwanted guest crashed into their house, Hurricane Harvey. The storm was approaching. How did she wake up? What did Crystal plan to do? She woke up fairly early that morning. She was going to go pick up her kids. And then she had scheduled some sales appointments later that day. Paul's surveillance cameras captured these images of Crystal leaving his house in the morning and getting into her black Mercedes. She left here around 7 in the morning. She probably arrived at Stephen's house 20, 30 minutes later. At 727, Crystal texts Paul, have an amazing day and you are so sweet. He texts back, I love you and I'll always support you. I began to get worried after she didn't start replying back to my text messages. Um, Crystal was known to reply back very quickly. Paul frantically texts that evening, I'm so worried about you, I hope you're okay. He never saw her again. Crystal just flew into the hot, humid air of a hurricane and vanished. Next. See this black Mercedes? Two people got out of it, and it doesn't belong to them. They find Crystal's car, but where is she? Among the chaos left behind from Hurricane Harvey, the story of Crystal McDowell really sticks out. The mother of two vanished just 24 hours before the massive storm reached shore. For more, let's head back to our Narissa Knight. Gorgeous real estate agent Crystal McDowell is missing. Hours before Hurricane Harvey bears down on Baytown, Texas. Did anybody think that Crystal may have just been trying to flee the storm? It just didn't make sense for a well-to-do woman like this who by all counts, loved her kids to just disappear. When Crystal's best friend, Bronze Beckley, learned she was missing, she went into full panic mode. I told my husband, I said, I feel something's not right. At first, Bronze worried, could Crystal have been kidnapped while showing a house? She is a real estate agent, and so that thought crossed her mind, but she didn't show up for her appointments that day. And so that was off the table. Bronze, who lives several hours away in Mississippi, tried to drive to Baytown to help in the search, but Harvey just wouldn't let her. Did you feel that she may have fallen victim to the storm, to no, Hurricane no, Harvey? Uh -uh. And neither did Chambers County Sheriff Brian Hawthorne. Hurricane Harvey is about to hit the city, wreaking havoc. How did you know that this had nothing to do with the hurricane? Well, we pretty well knew it had nothing to do with the hurricane because the missing person uh, complaint had come in prior to the storm. Where do you even begin with a missing person's report looking for a young mother when a storm is approaching? Nowadays, one of the first things that we look at is uh, social media. So we immediately pinged her telephone and we started doing other things such as getting search warrants on her phone records. We could not find her iPad. We couldn't find her telephone, so we were operating off of her phone records. 
one number would pop up a lot. Crystal's new boyfriend, Paul Hargrave. What did he tell you? Was he cooperative? Um, he was cooperative and fairly forthcoming, but we had problems getting some evidentiary items from him, such as video. He claimed he had video, so obviously that became a uh, red flag to us why somebody wouldn't be turning stuff over to the organization that was tasked in trying to find and locate her. I immediately went to the police department and gave them a statement, um, DNA, cell phone records, camera footage. I wanted to try to get them as much information as possible so that either they could A, rule me out, or B, focus on someone else that may have had something to do with this. Did you take a polygraph test? Yes, ma'am. What were the results? They didn't tell me the results, um, but there was a, yeah, a lot of yelling and, and screaming, and it wasn't a good experience for me. So I don't know if I passed or failed. They didn't really state. Then the sheriff talked to Crystal's ex-husband, Stephen. What did he tell you about her disappearance? About any He pretty well just had told us that he hadn't seen her, that she never showed up at his house. Wait a minute. Remember, didn't Paul say Crystal told him she was going to Stephen's house to pick up the kids? Detectives now put Stephen on the polygraph machine. How did he do in the polygraph? He, he did fail the polygraph. So he lied. Well, he wasn't forthcoming on all those uh, questions that we had in the initial uh, interviews with him. But a failed polygraph doesn't prove guilt, and it doesn't reveal what happened to Crystal. At this point, are both men persons of interest? Yes, at this point, yes. Two persons of interest, Paul, the boyfriend, the last man known to have seen Crystal alive, and Stephen, the ex-husband, who denied seeing her the day she disappeared. You know and love Crystal. What did you think? I felt Steve had done something. From the start, you suspected Steve. Yes, mm -hmm. Was it if he can't have her, no, no one... one can? And I think that's when the new boyfriend came into the picture because he had only been in the picture a month. He knew he didn't have a chance anymore. Mm -mm. She was gone. Right. She was gone, for real. But where? Investigators are about to make a pair of shocking discoveries. See this black car right here? This Mercedes? Two people got out of it and it doesn't belong to them. In the flooded parking lot of a cheap motel, Crystal's Mercedes is found abandoned. This home video shot from the motel balcony exclusively on Crime Watch Daily. They have a white car right up there that was waiting for them to come and now they're getting busted. They should be going to jail, but why is she in handcuffs? Those two people rummaging around the car are quickly ruled out as suspects. Inside the car, the sheriff finds something very suspicious. That obviously told us that uh, she or someone had placed the car there. And it, the way the car was parked, it appeared to us it was uh, more staged. We didn't think for a moment that, that Crystal had parked it. Why? What leads you to believe it was staged? This was a 2013 Mercedes. You would not normally see that in a Motel 6 parking lot with the keys left in it and the doors unlocked. Then, 11 days later... I got a call from the uh, Texas Ranger that Saturday afternoon um, saying um, that they had found her. A horrifying discovery. Crystal's decomposing body dumped in this wooded area, an area that was forecast to be covered by millions of gallons of water from the hurricane. He led us to the body. He actually, you know, drove us to the body. Who did? Who took them to Crystal's body? It was Crystal's husband, Stephen. He says he killed her. How did he take her life? It was by strangulation. He choked the life out of her. That's correct. In their home where she was staying with him. Correct. The sheriff says McDowell tearfully confessed, reportedly telling them he strangled Crystal in the living room with the children in the room next door. I think they know daddy hurt mommy and mommy's not coming back. 
McDowell was charged with first-degree felony murder. He's held on $500,000 bail. He hasn't yet entered a plea, and the prosecutor is expected to deliver the case to the grand jury. When you found out that her ex-husband, Stephen, had confessed to killing her, how did that hit you? Um, I was devastated. I was, um, doesn't feel like reality. Doesn't feel like she's, uh, she's actually gone. And so uh, it's, it's been difficult to, to come to that realization. What would you say to Stephen? I have no words for Stephen. Crystal had a long-lasting impact on Baytown. Her loved ones will never forget her. What's the hardest part now that you go through in, in missing her? Is and... knowing that I'm not going to get a text again. I'm not going to get a call again. We're not going to do birthday parties for our children again. I won't get over. I mean, this will be a long time before I'll get over losing her. Steve McDowell is being held on a $500,000 bond. He is yet to enter a plea in court. Coming up, a young mother. She would have been shot, I believe, four or five times. Who would unknowingly fall victim to an evil plot filled with love, jealousy. She knew he was seeing Jessica again. And deception. There was uh, Monopoly money that had been stuffed into Alice's pockets. Who really killed Alice Sin? Are you lying about what happened to Alice? No. That's next. Welcome back to Crime Watch Daily. This desolate stretch of desert is the setting of a tragic murder mystery. The last resting place of a young mother who would unknowingly fall victim to an evil plot filled with multiple lovers, jealousy, and deception. 21-year-old mother Alice Sin. Her sweet smile, her warm spirit, captured in dozens of family photos. She loved her parents. Um, she so appreciated their bringing her to the United States and the opportunities that that gave her. Alice, a native of China, lives in the city of Penn Knoll, just northeast of San Francisco. She raises her infant son while taking classes at a community college. Alice was poised on the brink of really finding her power. Becoming a mother was a truly significant event in her life. Prosecutor Mary Knox feels as though she knows Alice personally. But the grim reality is she's working Alice's murder case. Along a stretch of the dusty Nevada desert east of Reno, two mining inspectors reportedly discover a woman's mutilated and bullet-ridden corpse half buried in the sand. She was brutally murdered and then her body was was defaced. There were obvious badger eating marks on her body uh, where she had been clawed open from um, the animals that were out there. Dental records later identify the victim as Alice Sin. At the scene, her killer can only be identified by a few cryptic clues. There was uh, Monopoly money that had been stuffed into Alice's pockets and also kind of just spread through the, the badger den and in the dirt. Written on that play money, the acronyms NWO and ZOG. The initials stand for New World Order and Zionist Occupied Government, which are white supremacist groups. How did this innocent young mother, Alice, end up in this strange and horrifying condition in the desert, some 200 miles away from her home? Was Alice's murder some type of strange hate crime? When you have someone that takes their time to mutilate a body afterwards, I believe it's a display of a lot of hatred for that person. Detectives dig into Alice's personal life, looking for answers. She was a wonderful friend and was very thoughtful about her relationships with people. There, they find Alice's live-in boyfriend, 28-year-old tech consultant Raymond Wong, the father of Alice's child. Raymond was a very smart college graduate, owned a couple homes, just did very well for himself. His parents had immigrated here from Hong Kong. And he began dating her while she was a student at UC Davis. But Alice's college love affair was soon headed for a bitter lesson and some fierce competition. Cops say Raymond cheated on her with his on-again, off-again girlfriend, 25-year-old Jessica Tang. Jessica and Alice hate each other. They were aware of each other. Adding even more drama to an already torrid love triangle. Both women are pregnant with Raymond's babies. Alice 
wrote Raymond a letter saying that she knew he was seeing Jessica again um, and that Alice and Raymond needed to work out a relationship so that they could raise their baby together. That would never happen. Late November in Pendle, just days before Thanksgiving, Raymond calls police, telling them Alice is missing. But as detectives comb the city looking for the young mom, they become suspicious. As her friends had described, you know, she loved her child. She would have never just up and left and left the child with Raymond. Cops soon discover Alice's car left abandoned in a local shopping center parking lot. And shockingly, a $2 million life insurance policy Alice applied for, naming Raymond as her beneficiary. Then there's the other woman, Jessica Tang, who investigators say moved in with Raymond only days after Alice goes missing. Alice's clothing was moved from their bedroom. It was packaged up in garbage bags that were in the garage. Detectives wonder, does Raymond know more about Alice's disappearance than he's letting on? He says no and agrees to a polygraph test to prove it. Close your eyes and relax and just, just be comfortable. Do you know what happened to Alice? No. Are you lying about what happened to Alice? No. Raymond put himself through a polygraph, which he failed horribly. I think it came back as inconclusive, but that he had lied during certain parts of it. But cops know a failed polygraph is not enough to arrest Raymond Wong, now a prime suspect. It takes evidence and patience. Both were about to surface. Okay, we're leaving the body site where the murder occurred. Just two months after questioning Raymond, police find Alice's decomposed body in the Nevada desert. An autopsy confirms the heartbreaking reality. Alice was pregnant with Raymond's second child. Then, gruesome details of her death made cops even more suspicious about who viciously killed her. Her uterus had been removed. Um, which was important as uh, Alice was four months pregnant at the time that she was killed. The baby had been taken out of her body. Very sick and disgusting. Now, armed with a warrant to search Raymond's home, detectives make a disturbing discovery. There were literally thousands of hours of snuff videos recovered from Raymond Wong's computer that depicted women being killed and brutalized, um, tortured, and sexually assaulted. Some images involving children. Purely sadistic. He enjoyed inflicting pain. He enjoyed seeing other people inflict pain to others. Prosecutors are able to arrest and lock up Raymond Wong on child pornography charges. But with no direct physical evidence tying him to Alice Sin's brutal death, they hit a roadblock in the murder case. This case was challenging in that it depended on thousands of very small pieces of circumstantial evidence to create the whole picture. And the picture was about to blur. Before cops could nab their killer, Raymond Wong, now released from prison, escapes felony violations of state sex offender registration laws and quickly disappears. He fled the country to China. He was in China for three and a half years. He was going to beat the case and he was going to get out and be a free man. Almost a decade passes. Alice's savage murder goes unpunished. But now, cold case detectives could be on the verge of catching a major break, all thanks to Raymond's very own slip-up. He had approached the CIA and the FBI in Beijing, offering to work as a spy for the United States. Up next. They sort of hoodwinked Raymond and told him, oh, we'd love to work with you. This was our chance to finally bring this case to a close. Will a strategic ruse be enough to finally arrest Alice's killer? And will detectives crack it with the help of the other woman? Do you know what happened to Alice? No. Are you lying about what happened to Alice? No. Alice Sin's boyfriend and father of her child, Raymond Wong, tells investigators he doesn't know anything about her brutal murder. Cops think he's lying. However, they have two big problems. One, they don't have enough evidence to arrest him. And two, they don't know where he is. 21-year-old Alice Sin's bullet-ridden and pregnant mutilated body has been found in the dry Nevada desert.
She had had acid thrown on her face. Um, her hair had been scalped. Her body had been um, disposed of over an animal badger den. Cops feel certain they know who committed the horrifying act. Raymond Wong, the father of Alice's child. Wong was the one who reported Alice missing. And now he is too. He fled the country to China. Detectives have a cold case on their hands, but it's about to heat up. I think I was sitting at home and I got a phone call uh, from work, from dispatch, and they said, hey, uh, the uh, FBI is on the phone and they think that they have Raymond Wong in custody at SFO. And I was like, whoop, I'll be right in. The elusive Wong has been nabbed on a fake passport at the San Francisco airport. Turns out the brazen killer had schemed an elaborate cover-up to work as an international double spy and return to the United States. He had approached the CIA and the FBI in Beijing, offering to work as a spy for the United States. They sort of hoodwinked Raymond and told him, oh, we'd love to work with you. He was coming through customs, basically trying to say that he was contacted by um, the Chinese Secret Service. He wanted to work as a double agent for the United States, but he had to prove he could come in and out of the US freely. With only so much time before Raymond's free again, detectives need to move fast to secure a murder case. In a stealthy move, Detective Timothy Caldwell's reaches out to the other woman in Raymond's life, Jessica Tang. And now, nearly a dozen years after Alice's death, cops desperately need her to talk. It was one of the hardest interviews I'd, I'd ever had in my almost 14 year career as a police officer. And she didn't have Raymond in her life anymore, which was key for, for the interview. Investigators could not release Jessica's actual interview video to Crime Watch Daily, but Detective Caldwell says he grilled the woman who was Wong's other lover at the time over many days. Finally, she breaks and begins to tell what happened to Alice on that autumn day long ago. He drove her and Alice up to the middle of the desert in uh, Churchill County, Nevada. Amazingly, cops learned Wong got both women into the car by convincing each girlfriend they were going to take the other one out. The plan was hatched for Raymond to tell Alice that they were going to take Jessica up to the desert and kill her, but the actual plan was to murder Alice. Jessica really knew what was about to go down. During the car ride, um, she basically said she sent him back that Raymond and Alice um, argued almost the entire time up to Nevada. Along the way, police say Raymond pulls into a rest stop. Witnesses would later confirm seeing the threesome. The people who worked at the rest stop identified both Raymond and Alice as being there and identified another Asian woman sitting in the car, but they, they couldn't get a good look at her. Raymond later drives to a secluded spot off the road and parks. Jessica says he and Alice got out of the car and they're arguing. She said Raymond told her to stay in the car that Raymond and Alice got to, went to the back, um, and then she heard the gunshots and she saw the body fall. Raymond then forces Jessica out of the back seat. He puts the gun in her hand, says, you have to shoot her too. So she says that she just turned her head and she shot once, and she didn't want Raymond to kill her for refusing, so she did it. Jessica says she gets back into the car, but Raymond does not. Police believe that's when Raymond callously acts out his snuff fantasies, mutilating the body. Purely sadistic. He enjoyed inflicting pain. And then leaving fake clues. She described him throwing papers around the body. It was the Monopoly money found around Alice with those white supremacist initials, apparently only placed as part of Raymond's scheme to throw police off his trail. Detectives later learned that Raymond sent a bogus message to the news media to try and make it look like a hate group killed Alice. An email was sent to all of the San Francisco Bay Area news groups um, from the Aryan Knights claiming responsibility for Alice's murder. They were able to track the IP address back to the uh, internet cafe in Calgary. Investigators discover Raymond was there on business at the time. Police find other compelling evidence on Raymond's home computer. He was looking for driving directions to the Nevada desert. He was calling different gun stores and he was actively researching two white supremacist organizations. He's a monster. Uh, he's pure evil hidden behind the guise of a normal person. Jessica's confession about what happened that night is the crucial link cops needed most. 
investigators finally put Raymond Wong in handcuffs. You're under arrest for the murder of Alice in 1999. Stand up, turn around, put your hands behind your back. I drove him out to county jail. Halfway out there, he said, hey, you know, when all this is over and I'm out, you know, we should go get a beer together. And I said, no, I don't think I'd, I'd like to hang out with you. Prosecutors build their case against Raymond. As for Jessica Tang. She ultimately pled guilty to being a conspirator um, after the fact, given um, some very significant cardiac issues that she has. She was placed on five years of felony probation. Her testimony sealed the fate of Raymond Wong. The jury convicted him of first degree murder. He was sentenced to 50 years to life in prison. Raymond's exactly where he deserves to be, behind bars to where he can't hurt another woman again. A bittersweet justice for the young mother, Alice Sin, unaware of the monster she had loved. This tremendous opportunity that was in front of Alice to have really, I think, what would have been an incredible life, just taken for such senseless reasons. Right now, let's go a little deeper into the deal Jessica Tang received. No prison time, just probation. To talk to us about that, let's bring in attorney and Crime Watch Daily legal contributor, Jesse Weber. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. So I gotta say, I'm surprised on one hand, this is a woman who confessed to contributing to that crime, to shooting the victim in this case. That's one side. The flip side of it is, she was their star witness. We know that she suffers a medical condition, and there's been serious questions about whether or not she was under duress when she committed this crime. So I could understand why she wasn't sentenced to prison. Am I surprised? I think she should have been. She fired the shot. She fired the shot. What the court is saying with her probation is, you did something wrong. There was unlawful contact. We're taking some of your rights away. You'll be under supervision. However, because there's certain circumstances, because she said she feared for her life, there might have been a reason why they said, you know what, we're going to reduce your sentence a little bit. Jesse Weber, thanks as always for being here with us. Now, we want to hear from you. Do you think Jessica Tang should have served prison time? Sound off right now on our Facebook page. Coming up, two women who share the same sad fate. I don't want to know why. Leaving some to wonder if a serial killer is still working his way up this Ohio highway. Do you think the person that killed Lindsay and Danielle has killed again? Our all new investigation next. Our next story today is out of Ohio, where some residents are wondering if the same killer is targeting young women in and around the city of Columbus. Our Billy Jensen is on the ground with our all new investigation. Two young women savagely murdered and dumped. She was in a field and like 85% skeletonized. Both victims leave two young daughters behind. Someone out there knows something. Now the question, do they both share the same killer? He's a monster. Detectives step up their hunt, tracking every tip, every clue, every loose end. Justice needs to be done in these cases. The field, the remains, the potential suspects. Have you had any leads at all, any persons of interest? What kind of a little girl was Danielle? Feisty. Born on the 4th of July, Scott Green tells our Billy Jensen his daughter was always a firecracker. I can remember taking her camping and her just throwing a fit because she wouldn't pee out in the woods. That feisty childhood spirit would serve Danielle well over the years, fueling her determination and drive. She wanted to be a veterinarian. She had a heart of gold. I mean, she, she'd do anything for anybody. And that's why Scott Green can't imagine why anyone would want to hurt his little girl. It's like a nightmare, I mean, that I live every day. I can't wake up from it, and it's fine. The nightmare for Danielle's family begins on one crisp November day, a couple dozen miles south of Columbus. Two farmers working a field uh, discovered what they believed to be human remains. When Sergeant Jared Collins and his team of investigators get to the scene, they confirm the worst. We did have human remains um, laying by a creek roughly 200, 250 yards off the roadway. It's the corpse of 25-year-old Danielle Green. The remains were uh, essentially skeletal. 
As family members struggle for answers, detectives wonder if Danielle's death could be connected to the murder of another young woman. 30-year-old Lindsay Maccabee, cops discovering her body just a month before they found Danielle's, only 15 miles away. Essentially, we had a body roughly 25 yards off the roadway in a already cut cornfield, fully visible from the roadway. The body had been deceased uh, within 24 hour time period. Where were you when you heard the news? I was at home and the sheriffs came to our door and told us they found a body naked, bled out, severely beaten. Cops now believe there could be a connection between Lindsay and Danielle's murder. Both bodies were within proximity to County Road 17, which is Pleasantville Road, which runs essentially halfway across the county. Could it be possible that they were both dumped on the same night? No. But the similarities are too chilling to ignore, both from the same area of Columbus, both the mother of two little girls. And then the biggest shocker, Lindsay and Danielle were friends. In fact, they lived together in the same house. So who are we looking for? I wish we had the answers on even the type of person or the MO or anything that would give us that little piece of information we need to keep going on this. Wish yeah. somebody would have seen something, Yeah. anything. Detectives took Lindsay's mother, brother, and our Billy Jensen back to where they found her body. And this is a place, we got a railroad crossing right here. Anybody that's pulling up is gonna be slowing down. Right. Do you think he wanted her to be found? Well, it would appear. And less than a dozen miles away, we're with Danielle's dad when cops show him where they found his daughter. You think the killer could have known the area? I think so. I think so. General, these things usually aren't random. A father's pain unbearable, still haunted by his daughter's final moments. You wonder if she suffered at all or went quick. I miss her so much. Detectives don't know who may have killed the young women or why. What about the people that you talked to on the streets? What did they say about Lindsay? No one had anything bad to say about her. Danielle's dad, Scott Green, took us back to those streets where his daughter lived. And this is the main strip yep. of Parsons. Scott and Crime Watch Daily went door to door looking for any piece of critical information. As we dug deeper, many pointed us in the direction of one particular place this safe house for women. We're here in South Columbus, where both Danielle and Lindsay lived together at this home, which had a nickname, the home for lost children. From inside the home comes Sierra, who says she was best friends with Lindsay and Danielle and lived with them at the home for lost children. Do you think the same guy killed both girls? I do. Lindsay and Danielle was probably both together when they both got killed. And Sierra takes it one chilling step further. She believes Lindsay and Danielle may have even known their killer. I feel in my heart, I think we passed this guy. He's close to us and he could be our next door neighbor. We don't know. Back at the Sheriff's Department, detectives are listing names. Now, residents fear a serial killer could be living among them. Do you think the person that killed Lindsay and Danielle has killed again? That's a great question, I don't know. Lindsay's brother hopes someone somewhere will see this story and come forward with the information that brings his sister's killer to justice. I know she prayed to God, begging for her life, and I, I miss her, and I love her. And Danielle's heartbroken dad won't rest until they find the monster who viciously murdered his daughter. I hope he gets the needle. I hope he suffers like she did. I just wish she'd come home one day, you know? I'm gonna miss her so damn much. If you know anything about the deaths of Lindsay or Danielle, you can submit a tip on the Fairfield County Sheriff's Office tip line at 1-740-652-7339.